Okay, we are rolling. Champions of Champions Boxing Talk here. Um, if you want, you can subscribe, like or dislike. I don't usually say them things because I think it's rather corny, but it's a sales pitch around here on YouTube, isn't it? Anyway, straight to the action. I'm going to start by talking about Amir Khan's fight with Phil LaGreco this weekend. And I have to say... It was exciting. It was riveting. Amir Khan got in the ring for the first time in two years. The hand speed was there. He landed a classic Amir Khan combination, which led to a big right hand that dropped Phil LaGreco. He got up from the canvas. Amir Khan went in there like, you know, a true boxing finisher, shall we say. And got the job done within 40 seconds. It was electric. Absolutely electric. The crowd was wild. People from the jungle was there. Dennis Wise, ex-footballers. You name it. All celebrating. The king returns. Long live the king. He's still got some elements of talent in him, hasn't he? There's no question about it. It was fabulous. But... You guessed it. You was waiting for it. There's a butt coming. But. I could have given Amir Khan better work than Phil LaGreco did. He's had harder sparring sessions than this fight. Eddie Hearn could have given Amir Khan a better fight than that dude. And I'm not saying Phil LaGreco is a bum or anything. I respect all fighters. But 40 seconds for a guy that's been out the ring for two years is not good. People say, oh, this guy went 10 rounds with Sean Porter. He went three rounds with Errol Spence. Good. They shook off some rust. They got some rounds in. This is what used to happen to Mike Tyson in his build-up to a fight with Lennox Lewis. He used to come to the UK, fight in Scotland, knock someone out in one round. And then reality hits. What are you going to do when Lennox Lewis takes you out of two, three, four, five rounds? Right? Amir Khan needed rounds. Now, I'm not saying that you should let your opponent off the hook, but I, don't, I think this helped Amir Khan in terms of confidence, but nothing else. The neighbour's shouting, ladies and gentlemen. It only helped Amir Khan in terms of confidence. But you can't live in a sport just off what goes in your head alone. It has to come from the body in practice. And I don't care how many sparring sessions you've had or 40 second fights you've had. When you meet Errol Spence, who will get past 40 seconds. When you meet Keith Furman, who will get past 40 seconds. Dare I say the big bad wolf. When you meet Kell Brook. Who will get through 40 seconds. Kelbrook got through five rounds of against Triple G. Damn it. Right? We know Amir Khan is dangerous early. But if you get out of that early, shall we say, going through the streets where you know there are muggers. But once you get across the road, you know you're safe. If you can get across that road against Amir Khan, then we'll really see what he's got left. Because this told us nothing. Absolutely nothing. I've seen Amir Khan hit pads and look as impressive as this. And he did look impressive. Listen, he always looks impressive. He is talented. But please don't think this is a criticism. It's just a fact. I watched Adrian Broner v Jesse Vargas and those guys those guys went at it for 12 rounds. I wish Amir Khan would have had a bit of that work. He needs someone like one of those two next. Because winning easy eventually leads to hard defeat. What do I mean by that? 40 seconds gives you a false sense of security. But not a workout. Some people can run a mile really fast. But they can't do a marathon. That is a different ball game. So. Next fight please. Has to be against a durable guy. 
someone who has reflexes to defend themselves as well, right? And will get through a few rounds. I He needed a bare minimum four to six rounds just to shake off those cobwebs. And Phil LaGreco, it was a big letdown from his perspective. I mean, fancy talking all that smack and then that happening to you. I mean, come on. Once Amir had him hurt, he was going to go. I mean, people criticised Zab Judith, but at least Zab Judah went five rounds with Amir Khan. Phil LaGreco is up there now with Audley Harrison. People said Audley Harrison's check should be docked. Well, if Audley Harrison's check should be docked, Phil LaGreco should, because Audley Harrison lost because of incompetence. And Phil LaGreco is incompetent at that level. Get Amir Khan in there with a decent guy. I'm thinking, can they get hold of Mike Alvarado, who didn't fight Manny Pacquiao? Can they get hold of someone like that? Just, he needs some rounds. I'd, you know what I would have done after that fight? I'll be honest with you. I'd have said, Amir, stay in the ring. We're bringing in your sparring partners to give you a few more rounds on the night. We're taking the headgear off and these sparring partners are fighting you. So everybody in the in, in the Echo Arena in Liverpool, please stay seated. Amy is going to carry on fighting. Don't go anywhere. In fact, Kel, we can have the fight now. Go on, get go, go to the changing rooms. Let's shake this rust off. Because it was pathetic. Honestly. And it sounds like I'm being critical of Khan. But it is just a genuine fact. We don't know we haven't learned anything new from this fight. We know he's still got power, he's still got speed, he's still got timing. Has he got stamina? Has he got that dogfight in him? Has he learned to finally position and tuck that chin and have a good defence which has derailed him in the past? And has generally shown up when a bit of fatigue has come in and Ami has lost concentration. Has he fixed these tricks? Has he? We don't know. It's hard for an old dog to learn new tricks. But he's going to have to become a young dog in his mind and learn those tricks. He's still only 31. But I don't know what he's going to react when he gets a body shot. And then the hands come down. And the other guy has managed to survive more than 40 seconds. And he gets clipped. And where does he get clipped? Does he get clipped when the chin's tucked? Or is it up in the air like the neighbours washing, waiting to be hung out and drawn? We don't know these things. Phil LaGreco did not give us that. But great performance in an exhibition sense. You know, you don't get paid for overtime in boxing or anything in life, really, these days. Overtime is starting to go out of fashion. But you have to realise there's a potential 36-minute bout in boxing. Amir Khan used to be a great 36-minute fighter. He's proved it against Devin Alexander, Louis Colazzo, uh, Mr. Katelnik, you name it. Marcus Madonna. But that was a while ago. We haven't seen him do that for three years. Last time was Chris Algieri. Moving on swiftly, Tank Davis looked fantastic to me. Tank Davis, he had all the artillery, didn't he? Speed, power, body shots, placements, awkward stances, footwork. I think this was the best that Tank Davis has ever looked. And you know something? Without the Mayweather promotion in the ring with him and all of that stuff, he looked a more comfortable man. In that interview with Jim Gray, I was really impressed. The way he's took his, he's gone away from where he was originally, and he's relocated, and he's refocused, and it showed. He was much better last night than he was on the Mayweather McGregor card. Now let me say something. He was overly criticised on the Mayweather uh, card. This guy's only a young fighter, and look what he's done already. But the power, the hand speed, the movement. I can't stress enough how much potential this man has. And I believe 
if he continues to focus and be the Tank Davis, the personality we saw last night, he will get better because I don't believe Tank Davis's nature is to be a Floyd Mayweather. I believe Tank Davis is more of a Carl Frampton type personality, which we're also going to talk about. Tank Davis is a man that gets his head down when he's at his best, is a student, works on his game, focuses, and it works for him. I think Floyd is at his best. Floyd Mayweather was at his best when there was a lot of stuff going on around him and he was being busy. And sort of this, the way he hyped himself up, I'm the greatest and all this stuff, sort of Muhammad Ali thing, really helped him as a fighter. I don't think it does, Tank. People are different. People are different. And I think Tank Davis is different to Floyd in personality type. I'm not going to criticise Floyd's handling with Tank. Floyd Mayweather has given some boxers opportunities they could never, ever have dreamed of. Credit to him. But like Nigel Benn, who is taking a step back from his son's progress, I think Floyd needs to do a little bit that with Tank. Will Tank Davis be able to deal with Lomachenko? Well, that is a real step up. You're thinking Lomachenko at this point, but upsets happen in boxing and if that was an upset if tank davis beat lomachenko i would not be thinking next day we'd just seen buster douglas v mike tyson the sequel i wouldn't because tank davis can hurt you tank davis with those body shots and movement can slow a moving target down you're not telling me that rigandell is currently tank davis he isn't Nicholas Walters, I don't believe, is Tank Davis. I think if Tank Davis did eventually fight Lomachenko, he would put a focus into that camp and into that ring, unlike many, unlike any current opponent that Lomachenko has faced. And Lomachenko has fought some good guys. I think Tank is potentially the best opponent Lomo, Lomo sorry, will ever face. I do. So that's Mr. Tank Davis. Still favour Loma, but if Tank Davis won, it would just be like the turning over of a new page. I wouldn't be thinking, oh my God, what a shock. It wouldn't be a massive shock. And I know people, Loma fans, will get upset with that. But once the dust settled, they would believe that it wasn't the biggest upset in boxing history either. Moving on. Carl Frampton, he definitely looked better than his fight coming back against Garcia last year. In that fight, Carl Frampton was fighting the wrong fight. He looked lethargic. His reflexes were slower. The timing wasn't as great as usual. It was good early, but then it faded late. Against Nonito Donaire, Carl Frampton boxed very well. Boxed very well. The only success... Or sh I should say the only criti critique or critical uh, point of view I've got in this fight for Carl Frampton was Carl Frampton has brilliant footwork. His footwork to me looks like Pacquiao and Lomachenko. Just watch his feet. Don't watch anything up top. Just watch his footwork. Watch the speed of the footwork. Watch the placement of the footwork. Watch how he uses those feet to turn from different angles to get out of trouble when he's in the centre of the ring when another fighter is on the attack. Right? Carl Frampton should have fought all that fight that way. Boxing, moving, using them feet. In, out, mainly out, right? Because when the fight was at a distance... Donaire really didn't have a say in the matter. He was being clinically outboxed. The jab of Carl Frampton when he doubles it up and when he uses it as a single jab is fantastic. He landed some real crisp, sharp right hands, particularly again early. But when he was following Rigandell to the ropes, Rigandell, sorry, Donaire to the ropes, there was no need for that. He was getting into an exchange that 
Donaire. Donaire didn't cut off the ring against Carl Frampton and bring him into a dogfight. Frampton was going up to him and going into a dogfight when it was unnecessary. And we all know Donaire can still punch. And he landed some real quality uppercuts that actually won him a few rounds in this fight. And later on, we know something about Carl Frampton. His stanima is a little bit, I think, on the questionable side. He was running in that last, in the 12th round. I had the fight 8-4 to four, Carl Frampton. I thought it was a clear win. But he was hurt badly again when he stood in front of Donaire and traded. And Donaire is a hitter. And when you get hit by him, you stay hit. And Carl Frampton was not using footwork in the 12th round to get away or create space and angles for himself. He was using it to retreat and get away. And he looked a bit busted up by a fighter who is past his prime. Now, I have this problem with James DeGale. Sometimes Carl Frampton doesn't stick to what he does best. He gets involved with other people's best qualities. Punch him with a puncher, slug him with a slugger. He's a classical moving boxer. Just do that. Because if you do do that, very few fighters in the world can live with Carl Frampton. Donaire, for me, couldn't believe his luck. He thought, wow, I'm not cutting the ring off. He's coming to me. Why? Because every time he slugged with Donaire on the ropes, Carl Frampton wasn't getting the better of it. He may have been landing more shots, but the quality shots were from Donaire. So, I would keep that in mind. Mr. Charlo looks the business, doesn't he? What was it, a second round knockout? Fantastic knockout. He's got hand speed. He's got placement. He's got confidence. It's all there. Did I expect him to win this quickly? No, I didn't. Do I need to say anything more about Mr. Charlo? No, I don't. Do we want to see a Golovkin fight? Yes, we do. Jim Gray said at the end of his stoppage win that... <sighs> He might be the most avoided man currently in the middleweight division. Well, that mirrors Gennady Golovkin of a few years ago, doesn't it? Mr. Charlo now is feeling the same thing that I believe Golovkin felt all those times ago. Maybe still because of this nonsense with Canelo. And it's going to take a while to create a Billy Joe Saunders fight. I think a Charlo match would be brilliant. Do I think that Charlo would beat Golovkin? Well, it's different levels. Golovkin's jab may be able to time that speed and make... You see, this is what happens. When you fight elite fighters, Jim Watts said this once, and I think it was a good analogy. When you fight good fighters, your game plan and everything you do works smoothly. The difference between a good fighter and an elite fighter is this. The things that normally work stop working fluently. They work at times, but they don't work as often as they usually do. And sometimes that can put doubt in a human being's mind. It puts them under more pressure. And then they realize that there's also a, a, a skill set on the other side that is equal to theirs, if not better than theirs. Then they have to go to levels that they've never been before. Sometimes Mr. Charlo may beat certain opponents greater than Golovkin did. But it's when the two are in the ring and Charlo is faced with that elite jab, that elite power he's never faced before. Actually a guy that doesn't fall over with the first power punch you hit him with. Actually a guy that takes body shots really well and that's rare actually a guy who can box and go to war when some of charlo's things are bound to not work vegan Adi golovkin then what then that's the question what then does charlo mix it up he could do but we've yet to see it let's not jump the gun People are throwing Gennady Golovkin under the bridge. You're forgetting recently he's fought some very good fighters. Kell Brook, um, Canelo Alvarez, 
um, Danny Jacobs, David Lemieux, who is, you know, is real durable. Has Mr. Charlo faced this level yet? Or, or has he got a Gennady Golovkin on his resume? Has he got a Danny Jacobs there? Has he got a Billy Joe Saunders there? Not yet. So, it's to be continued for Mr. Charlo, but I think he's going to be the real deal. I think he's going to be the real deal. I do think he will become the elite fighter, not have to, to not have to adapt to elite fighters. I think he will get there. What other fights did we see? Da, 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 da. I think we'll end on this one. Because I think we're 20 minutes in already. Yeah. Adrian Broner v Jesse Vargas. Jesse Vargas. Sort of like Carl Frampton, though I don't think he's as gifted as Carl Frampton. Started off really good at distance, using the jab. Pelting Adrian Broner with that jab. Pelting him to the body. Pelting him to the head. Winning the first two rounds comfortably. Then he starts getting into exchanges with Adrian Broner up close. He starts to put on the macho Mexican act. That, to me, gave Adrian Broner chances. The first two rounds, I thought, oh my, Adrian Broner is... Th he's the Adrian Broner that turned up against Mikey Garcia again. He's not letting his hands go. I don't believe, but then again, I corrected my own thoughts. You can't let your hands go when you're at the end of a jab. Because you're not in range to let your hands go. And when Jesse had him at range at the end of his jab, AB could not really do anything about it. It's when he started getting macho. And a little fatigued that Adrian Broner had big success in that fight. I thought in terms of the all-round fight, Jesse threw more. He landed slightly more. I think he edged that fight 7-5. to five. I can't call it an absolute robbery that the judges called it a draw. But I felt Jesse slightly won. But when they were in range, credit to AB, he did let his hands go. But he had to. This was his final chance. I think the networks thought, if this is a real close fight, let's call it even. Because Adrian Broner is a draw. And they need him around. Right? You have to beat Adrian Broner really convincingly to get the win. That what, what Sean Porter beat him very clearly to me. And one of the, one of the judges' scorecards was close. So you can imagine Jesse Vargas with a 7-5 to five probably wasn't going to get the fight. Even one of the judges gave it to Adrian Broner, which I thought was silly. But the other two, even, I could see a draw, but I really did think Jesse won. He landed shots to the body, the jab was good. Maybe not the biggest puncher that Adrian Broner has ever faced, but had Jesse Vargas had some real dynamic power like a Madonna or a Porter... Adrian Broner would have been seeing stars, but then again, Adrian Broner is durable and has a great chin. He takes shots very well, kind of what a young Shane Mosley used to take him. Only he's not in the same league as Shane Mosley, but you, you know what I'm saying. He has that ruggedness about him, Adrian Broner. But he landed some withering uppercuts against Jesse Vargas, timed him really well. Slowed Jesse down, I think, himself with some body shots. Drew Jesse into a fight. And Jesse, because he was fatigued, kept leaning sort of forward, allowing AB to operate with those uppercuts as, you know, Jesse's head was ducking low. So I think it was a fight that AB got back into, but it wasn't necessary. Jesse could have kept him on the end of that jab and frustrated Broner, but. You know, you can't, you can take the man out of Mexico, but you can't take Mexico out of the man. And Jesse Vargas, once AB started, you know, doing all this flamboyant stuff, got into a war and gave Adrian Broner the chance to get the draw on the night. Because he doesn't really, Jesse Vargas, he has the work rate of a Madonna and Porter at times. But he doesn't have the power. So he's better off boxing AB at range. And keeping him on the end of a jab. Sort of like what Mikey Garcia did a lot of the times. A lot smaller than Jesse Vargas. But 
you know where I'm coming from. And Jesse Vargas does tend to tire, but I think once again this catch weight may have had something to do with it. Sean Porter, who has been hit by Keith Furman and many other people, was not dropped, but he was dropped by Adrian Broner. Now that fight was at a catch weight. I think Jesse Va I think Adrian Broner got this draw really because of the catch weight. Jesse Vargas started to gas after, say, nine rounds. Had he been fully fledged at welterweight and not had to pull himself down, maybe Jesse would have been able to carry on his early work and win a unanimous decision. But I do think it was a great fight. I give Adrian Broner credit for actually letting the hands go when they were in the exchange and in the pocket and putting up a good showing. And, of course, Jesse Vargas always does. You know, that guy is, well, he's a warrior. But let's face it, Adrian Broner there was 28 years of age. And an ancient Manny Pacquiao beat Jesse Vargas very sort of easy. He even dropped Jesse Vargas. Adrian Broner is a good B-level fighter. A very good, maybe world-class right he's a champion in four weight divisions people laugh at the guy but i'm telling you you try to do it this guy is talented world-class fighter b plus level and people laugh at b plus level fighters they're good on a good night they can beat an a level fighter if things go in their way right but please he's stop trying to live floyd mayweather's legacy through adrian broner it's not gonna happen let adrian broner be adrian broner and that's all I've got to say. So, a great night of boxing. I nearly got all of them right. I got all of them right, but the Vargas-Broner fight. And I can't really say I got it right, really, because I thought he won, because the judges didn't see it how I saw it. I even got Manchester United right against Tottenham. We're going to the FA Cup final, and hopefully we're going to win it. And hopefully in the future I'm going to have more boxing videos for you. And this is Champions of Champions Boxing Talk. I'm out.